Hi everyone, myself Dr. Vinod. As an orthopedician, on a regular basis, the most common fracture we come across in our operative setup is fracture shaft of tibia and the most common modality we choose is internal fixation with a nail or in a layman term, rod fixation for the shaft of tibia. In our channel, I have already uploaded a video regarding the tibia nail extraction or tibia nail removal in a step-by-step -step manner and it has been already been viewed nearly 5000 times in our channel. Many of the friends have been commenting in the comment section to post a video regarding fixation of tibia fracture with a nail. Today, I am going to show you the tibia shaft fracture and it is one of the rare fracture, a rare type of fracture because this particular patient already have a plate in situ. He had a fracture three to four years before and he underwent an operative management with uh, the for the proximal tibia with a plate fixation and he now acquired a fracture just to below the lower end of the plate there is a new fracture so what we are going to do now we are going to remove the plate first then we are going to fix the fracture with the tibia nail now I am marking the incision for the plate removal. The plate was placed more on the anteromedial aspect so it is easily palpable. I am going to take incision just over the old surgical scar of the plate fixation. Generally for the nail fixation we take incision just below the petal arm palpating the tibial tuberosity but since in this is a special case where we are going to remove the plate first then we are going for plan for nail fixation so first i am taking the skin incision and i am going to go layer by layer dissecting the subcutaneous tissue then after that immediately opening the subcutaneous fascia i could feel the plate then I am going to use the mosquito and I am going to split the subcutaneous fascia then directly I could see the plate or I could expose the plate in multiple areas then layer by layer I am doing the dissection to remove the fibrous tissue that is spread over the plate. So after removing the fibrous tissue I am going to expose the plate end to end because none, no part of the plate should not be left unexposed because sometimes that may act as a difficult or that may act as a obstacle for the complete plate removal. So after confirming that plate is exposed I am removing the fibrous tissue there is some minor bleeding from that area so I am using a cautery to coagulate the minor bleeding then I am cutting the fibrous tissue over the plate I am I am using a periosteal elevator to elevate the periosteum as well as the fibrous tissue covering the plate. Now coming to the important thing, we have to free the screw head or the we have to free the surrounding of the screw head for, for the proper screw removal. We have to double sure that the fibrous tissue should not be holding the plate or the screw head in any aspect because this will make our work very tedious during the screw removal as well as plate removal. So after making sure that all the fibrous tissues are removed, then I am going to free the screw head or the surrounding of the screw head. Then I will remove the screws one by one. The amount of fibrous tissue found over the plate differs from person to person as well as the previous surgical experience. If the previous surgery involves more or poor tissue handling, then there is a chance that postoperatively patient will end up with more fibrous tissue after the surgery. So the previous surgery also pose a important or, or they also play an important role in the revision surgery or the future surgeries. So here there is a in the proximal part there are multiple fibrous tissue. So I am exposing the fibrous tissue clearly then I am lifting the or they are I am elevating the fibrous tissue with the periosteal elevator and I am making sure that all of the fibrous tissue are removed. Then I am removing the screw one by one. So as you can see the motion I am using the one hand will be holding the screw driver head against the screw head then with the other hand I am just doing a rotational or torsional movement to remove the screw. This is the basic thing regarding the screw removal because if we use two hands for the 
uh, screw removal with the screwdriver there is a chance that the screw head may get injured or the screw head may get damaged and there is also a chance that the, there will be a breakage of the screw head with the screw or the threads lying within the bone. So this might also be possible if you are not properly using the screw removal mechanism. Then we have to do a one more procedure to drill out the uh, this thing remaining screw part from the bone head. So here I am removing it carefully one by one and I am making sure that there, no, there won't be any metal debris left inside the screw hole. Sometimes while application of the screw itself there might be a chance that due to too much of tightening the screw head part might be damaged or the proper alignment of the or the proper shape of the screw head may be damaged. So that uh, in that cases if we use a even if we use a normal screwdriver for the screw removal that time there is a chance that thus mechanism or the screw head as well as the screwdriver tip may not be superimposing properly and there is a chance that there will be a difficult removal of screw. So that time we will be using a plier or a hollow mill to remove the screw from the plate. So after removing all the screws one by one I will be taking a shiam shoot to make sure that all the screws are removed. Yes, then I will be exposing the plate completely and I will be removing the fibrous tissue that are surrounding the plate. So here I am passing a bone chisel just at the edge between the plate and the top surface of the bone and I am just malleting the chisel between the gap so that the plate can be lifted from the bone surface. This has to be done in a small or a step by step manner with a minor force. Yes, then we have to make sure that the plate is lifted from the surface of the bone. Then after removing the plate from the surface, I am going to chisel out the extra bone outgrowths. So generally assume that I am using if I am using a 10 hold plate, I will be putting only 7 to 8 screws. The other two holes will be left one above one below the fracture site. So there will be bone in growth or fibrous tissue in growth through that vacant screw holes. So that bone outgrowths if not removed that might be causing a irritation injury to the soft tissue post-operatively. I have seen few patients who have chronic complaints even after plate removal. So better to chisel out this bone outgrowths for better post-operative care. Then I have been making sure that the surface of the bone is made flat. Then I am going to suture these wounds in a layer by layer manner Be because for nailing I am going to take a separate incision on the anterior part of the knee joint. So I need to close this wound. Now I am going to take incision for the nailing. Yes. As I will be palpating the tibial tuberosity as well as the lower pole of petala then I will be taking the incision. So after taking the skin incision I will be taking the deep incision into the subcutaneous plane. After going beneath the subcutaneous plane the next structure I will be coming across will be a white glistening structure that will be the petalar tendon. I will be vertically splitting the petalar tendon to open the knee joint. So once I open the petalar tendon or once I split the petalar tendon there will be a synovial fluid yellow color fluid will be coming out just from the knee joint. So after opening the knee joint through splitting the petalar tendon I will be palpating the tibial slope then I will be inserting the bone owl to create the opening for the insertion of the nail. So I will be inserting the uh, owl bone owl under the guidance of the CM or a minor x-ray machine then I am inserting the guide wire through the proximal part of the fracture or the proximal part of the tibia. This guide wire has to be in the center both, both in the anteroposterior plane as well as in the lateral plane. This guide wire has gone past the distal fragment also under the CM guidance. Then now I am going to ream the inner hollow part of the tibia. So the reaming is most important because the reaming increases the blood supply. So assume that our bone gets 80% blood supply from the nutrient artery which means the intramedullar system and the rest 20% by the periosteal blood supply. But doing reaming increases the 
blood supply of the periosteum up to 2 to 3 times and one more use of reaming is for the proper fitting of the nail to the inner surface of the bone marrow we need to do reaming plus 1 the thickness of the nail to be used assume that if I am using the 9 millimeter thickness nail then I have to ream the inner surface of the bone marrow up to 10 millimeter with the 10 millimeter reamer then I will be using the reamer one by one in an increasing order to match the thickness of the bone marrow. So whenever I feel difficulty during the passing of the reamer then I will stop the reaming then I will be using the nail of width or thickness less than the reamer which thickness which was last used. So assume that if the 10 mm reamer passed till the distal fragment freely or with some difficulty but it had already passed through the distal fragment then I will be using a 9 millimeter thickness as well as I will choose the length of the uh, tibia nail based on the length of the tibia for the patient with the help of the x-ray guidance. In this particular patient I have used till 10 millimeter reamer so I am going to use a 9 millimeter width nail in this particular patient. The 11 millimeter reamer didn't go or it went with minor difficulty so I removed the 11 millimeter reamer then I am going to choose the length of the nail based on the patient's length then I am inserting the proper sized nail of 9 millimeter width into the medulla of this patient with the help of the guide wire. The thin wire you see is the guide wire through its guidance only we are going to insert the tibia nail for this particular patient. The black color part you see is called as a zig through which the proximal locking screws will be inserted. Yes, as you can see the holes in that zig black color area that will be directly going into the screw hole within the nail in the proximal or the top part. So I am inserting the nail with the knee joint in flexed position. This is very much important step because if the assistant unknowingly extends the knee joint which means he keeps the if he keeps the leg straight there is a chance that petala fracture might happen intraoperatively. So even though minor it is an important step then after inserting the nail I am going to fix the nail both distally as well as proximally and I am confirming it with the CM guidance. This is after closure of the wound. If you find this video useful do like and share and subscribe to Dr. Vinod's Medi360 channel. If you have any suggestions please drop them at the comment section.